All right, so we are going to get started. Welcome to everyone who is tuning in to learn and explore about multisensory integration and how we can apply this concept to our fall reduction programming. But it's actually not limited to just fall reduction programming. These concepts can be used for any of our clients or patients of any age, any performance level, athletes, seniors, children, everyone in between. So please do think of uh, this from a broader perspective. Uh, my name is Dr. Splickle. I am a podiatrist, a human movement specialist. I'm the founder of EBFA Global, which is an education company built around foot to core sequencing, barefoot science. And I'm the CEO and founder of Naboso, who's actually one of the sponsors in today's webinar. And then one of our other sponsors is Body Track Metrics, where Libby's on the line and she'll be speaking at the end to share with you some information about Body Track and the benefits of integrating their system in your fall reduction programming and the way that you are assessing balance in your clients, patients, and athletes. Okay, so here we go. As we jump into it, again, I already briefly mentioned Naboso. I will be referencing this at the end and sharing more with you about how you can get these products for your patients. And then similarly with BodyTrack, Libby will be coming on online in the end and we'll be sharing about how you can use the BodyTrack system for your patients as well. I already briefly introduced myself, but if you are uh, looking to learn a little bit more about barefoot science, foot to core, sensory processing, you can always follow me on the various social platforms, my websites, and I included my email in the comment section. Okay, so let's jump into it. We are obviously speaking about a fall reduction program, hopefully from a slightly different perspective or something new. I always love to have these little pearls of knowledge that professionals can get from my webinars. So if you learn at least one new thing, then to me, that is a success. All right, so we know that the reality of falls is one, they are prevalent. Two, they are life-changing for a lot of the individuals who are experiencing them. And then three, they are expensive. So the healthcare costs involved in the sequelae of a fall or a, a patient's um, injuries post-fall is very expensive and can lead to many other comorbidities outside of just um, now they have decreased mobility, but what is the effect on uh, quality of life, on emotion, on their mental status, the depression rates in seniors is extremely high, and then also the effect on cognitive decline, because if you're not moving a lot, you're not getting good cerebral blood flow, and that is going to definitely have cognitive effects. So what can we do to help these patients improve their function to reduce their faults? Of course, one of the things that probably comes to mind is going to be balance. What are these individuals balance and is balance a good outcome measure to predict falls? This is where the body track metric system really comes into play because you're able to assess that individual on a uh, real-time basis. Think of it almost like biofeedback, that the patient can see themselves in the way that their weight shifts underneath their feet on the body track system. So I like balance as a fall predictor, and I like to assess balance on the body track system because of that biofeedback uh, component to it. Now, balance function based off of research, we know that this is closely associated with the quality of life of that individual. So it's extremely important. Now, the way that we maintain balance from our eyes to our ears, to the vestibular system, to our joint capsules and the proprioceptive system, to the tactile or the touch on the bottom of the feet and the palm of the hands, these four input systems are continuously dancing with each other and interrelating. So the theme here is multi-sensory integration. How do these four input systems relate to each other? Do we essentially bring in visual, bring in vestibular, bring in proprioceptive and tactile, and then process them at the end in the central nervous system to essentially optimize our balance? Is that where it's happening or is it actually happening earlier? And do they actually have a compounding effect? on each other, meaning that if I combine tactile with visual, 
Could I actually increase the activation in the different cortices in the brain to improve my balance? And that's the point of this webinar. So we're going to take a deep dive in that and see are these four unique systems or how are they relating to each other to get more improvement, body awareness, joint position, sense, balance, stability, et cetera, for our patients. So we know that all these four input systems, they are processed ultimately in the central nervous system, in the neocortex. There's a visual cortex. There's a somatosensory cortex. There's an S1, M1. There's an auditory one. And all of these are actually interrelated. V1, S1, auditory is A1. And they have this compounding effect that we want to be able to optimize in our patients to, again, therefore, um, get a bigger bang for each exercise, right? So if we can uh, choose exercises that have the highest return and the greatest transfer to real life scenarios and sensory demands of the nervous system, that is where we're going to get the win for these patients and the reduction of these faults. So I already kind of proposed this question is how do these input systems relate to each other and are they unisensory mechanisms or are they multisensory mechanisms. So the multisensory processing is going to be the theme of today's webinar and really taking a deep dive in the specific programming that you can use to activate these different systems and to get a greater uh, stimulation. So when we think about multisensory integration, this refers to the process by which your nervous system integrates information from the different perceiving processes. So it's an integration. It is also going to be a compounding effect, which is what we're going to go into um, next. Now, the research demonstrates that the neurosequencing, this, this integration happens much earlier in the sensory processing pathway. And it optimizes or it actually heightens with multi-sensory stimulation. At Naboso, we refer to this as sensory stacking. Um, I don't know if anyone who's listening, listening is um, a biohacker. So I do a lot of biohacking and a big part of biohacking is what's called nootropics. And nootropics are different supplements um, and some of them are pharmaceutical based, but they're, they're essentially uh, medications or supplements that you can take that have an activating effect to the brain. So memory, uh, short memory, recall, concentration, focus, acuity, decision making, all of the cognitive processes that we need to be high performing individuals. Now, when it comes to nootropics and biohacking is that these different nootropics that you take actually have a heightening or a compounding effect to each other, which means that if I take caffeine, let's say as an example, and I want to add choline, or sorry, if I take uh, caffeine and I want to get a greater effect, I don't necessarily want to just increase the amount of caffeine. If I add another ingredient, they together raise the efficacy higher. Does that make sense? So that's what I want you to think of this same sensory processing. If I strategically incorporate visual with tactile stimulation, do I get this compounding and greater activation of the central nervous system and the way that sensory information is processing versus okay, what other tactile input can I add? There's only so much skin on the hands and the feet, right? So you essentially have a ceiling of sensory threshold that you can bring to these different input systems. So if we think of it as, aha, uh -huh, if I stack and I add tactile and I little, add a little bit of proprioceptive and I add some visual and auditory and vestibular, I am now compounding the activation in the brain and therefore the motor output. Okay, so that's the way that we want to think of it. And I love the biohacking analogy, um, and especially for those that do biohack. Hopefully you appreciate that. So the first concept that I want to think about of how you can start to think of how you shape your client's programming is what's called sensory conflict. So sensory conflict is continuously happening throughout our day. As soon as you put your shoes on, you created a sensory conflict. Your nervous system is essentially saying, oh, well, wait a minute, 
You just took away the tactile input from the ground. Now I don't feel the ground as much. What am I going to do? There's this internal conflict of how we maintain center of gravity. Okay, so I'm going to look at the other three input systems and upregulate them to help me orientate myself in space and control my movement. I'm going to most likely upregulate the proprioceptive. Okay, now this conflict is really putting context to every scenario that we're in. Another really good analogy of sensory conflict is going to be if an object is moving next to us. So we're standing next to a train and we are standing still, but the train is moving. Us looking at the train is a visual stimulus, right? So we see something moving in the visual, but the visual system has to communicate and put context to that and say, I'm not moving, the train is moving. So that struggle conversation and orientation is really important to the nervous system for you to be able to stand stable. Versus if we looked at something moving and felt like we were moving, this is where you actually start to get a lot of vestibular, um, nausea, so different, um, loss or compromised orientation in relationship to gravity, where the vestibular system and nausea are, those are two, two of the greatest ones. So that's where that conflict is important. Now we continuously have to challenge sensory conflicts to be able to deal with them in the real world. Um, so this is where if you have them in a scenario that something is moving, but they're not moving, it, it triggers this or vice versa. The shoe example is another very common sensory conflict. So once we take away that foot connection to the ground is a conflict. Your nervous system has to upregulate the other input systems. Now, if it can't do that because there is compromise or conflict in the other systems, we've got a problem. What if I have hearing loss and I have neuropathy and I have cataracts or the room is dark or there's shadows or it is sunset or something that is having multi-sensory system conflict that is very compromising to someone's balance and ability to move. So training them and putting in them in scenarios that challenges them with those conflicts is important. Normally, I would say I am not a big fan of the Eric's pad generally not a big fan of the Eric's pad because of the sensory disconnect that it creates from the feet. And I normally try to create a scenario that I want the nervous system to win. Okay. So as long as there's a why behind what we do and there's a logic, then we can do whatever we want, right? If we understand that logic. So if we say, but no, Dr. Emily, I use the Eric's pad because I am trying to mimic a sensory conflict and what my client or patient goes through as soon as they put on their cushioned insoles. What do I do? Right? <laughs> oh, goodness. So what do I do? So there is a reason to using the Eric's pad. Okay. If you have that as your reason. So here we go. So how do we start to introduce sensory conflict programming for our clients. So this is a way that you could start to do it. And this is based off of a research study that essentially had people spend 10 minutes a day in these different balance scenarios. And they would be essentially standing on one leg for a minute, or you could do 30 seconds per side in each of these different scenarios. So we want to first open all of the input systems. We want to be barefoot. We want you standing, not just barefoot, but you're gonna be barefoot on a hard surface, or really I would say be barefoot on Naboso. Let's wake up the tactile input system through the bottom of the feet. The eyes are open, there's a light in the room, your head is neutral to balance out the vestibular system. Boom, for a minute, let's reset or calibrate our input systems. Then you're going to start to introduce in each additional or successive 30 seconds or a minute, you're choosing how you're specifically designing the programming, and you're going to take away or alter conflict each of those input systems. 
So I'm barefoot on the bosu again, lots of tactile. This time though, I'm gonna shut my eyes. So I'm shutting my eyes, but my head is neutral. So I still got the vestibular coming in, but I'm taking away the visual input. That is the conflict. I'm then gonna progress through your head is extended. So just by bringing the head up, I'm shifting the vestibular system. And then that's going to create a conflict in that input system. And then we essentially repeat that and we take away two. So eyes are shut, it is extended. So you take away the eyes and the um, vestibular. Technically, you could combine all of those and have all the way on the bottom. Let's go on an Eric's pad. Oh, my goodness. And let's shut our eyes and let's extend our head. So we are taking away those three main input systems to then create that conflict. OK, so this is a way. This is the first way. Now, the way that my mind thinks is that I actually want to upgrade this even more because this may not transfer to all of the scenarios of how your nervous system resolves a sensory conflict okay so let's go to the next slide here and this is this is exactly the way that my mind kind of thinks is okay so we're on uh we're on the naboso mat we're barefoot on the naboso mat but this time we're actually going to hold the neural ball so the naboso neural ball which is right here. So I'm going to hold the neural ball. So I have tactile in my hands. The skin of the hands is just like the skin of the feet. So I have this, my feet are being stimulated, my hands are stimulated, my eyes are open, and my head is neutral. Maybe I want to bump it up even more. Do you see on the bottom here? Just another variation. I'm going to put kinesiology tape around the medial and the lateral ankle so that every movement that I have when I'm balancing on one leg, I'm essentially stimulating the proprioceptive system through the kinesiology tape. So I've got tactile foot, I've got tactile hand, I've got kinesiology tape on the proprioceptors of the ankle, I got my visual, I got my vestibular. Boom, I am stacked, right? That is the way that when you start to take away the eyes, the vestibular, now the strategy to solve the conflict, in my opinion, transfers to a more real world scenario because maybe they're holding their phone and that's tactile. They're going to be triggering the nervous system because of something in their hand. What if they have their hand on a cane, right? Cane Hand stimulation is profound on what it does to balance and the strategy to these sensory conflicts. So this is just another variation of how you could take this, which was really the research study. They weren't on Nobosa, they were just barefoot on a hard surface, but we could take that and just upgrade it one notch to add in these other opportunities to resolve sensory conflict. Okay, and I hope that makes sense. If there's any questions on that, definitely type those in and we'll go over those towards the end. So bringing in that stimulation from the feet, bringing in that stimulation from the hand, you could also have them standing on a vibration platform if you want, you could hold, instead of a neural ball, you could hold um, hyperspheres, a ball that vibrates, something else, right? So there's different input systems that we could pull into this if you would like. Now, the second concept that I want to go into for this webinar is the sensory stacking. So this multi-sensory input system and how we actually get a compounding or a heightening response when we bring in additional input systems, okay? Now, the first one is going to be tactile and proprioceptive. This is probably the easiest to understand, the easiest to shape and incorporate with your clients. We're gonna go back to the Naboso barefoot and the kinesiology tape as the example here. So if I was doing a balance exercise and a balance program, pick whatever balance exercises you want to do with your patient or your client. And this time I'm going to have them, or I'm gonna make sure that I have them barefoot on an Oboso mat, or if you have the body track system, the top cover of the body track is technically the Naboso material. So you have not only an assessment tool, but you have a tool that you can train on. This is a two for one device, which is now bringing in sensory stimulation to those patients' feet and their nervous system. So I got the barefoot tactile bottom of the feet, and then I got the K-tape getting the proprioceptors around that joint capsule. Now around this tactile and proprioceptive, what I wanna just mention briefly as a key, key takeaway here is that when we say tactile, what I'm referencing is mechanoceptive. 
And mechanoceptive means the mechanoceptors, which are tactile nerves or touch nerves on the palm of the hand and the bottom of the feet. Okay, these nerves are sensitive to texture, which is two point discrimination. That's what the Noboso products all carry is a two point discrimination pattern on them. That's what we stimulate. And then second is skin stretch is a mechanoceptive stimuli. And then third is vibration. So when you want to optimize the feet, go those three ways, right? Bring in texture, Naboso. Bring in vibration, any vibration platform that's out there, power plate, and there's many vibe plate and, and different ones, um, whichever you feel comfortable working with. And then skin stretch is similar to the tape, but the skin is on the bottom of the foot. Okay. And then the proprioceptors, the muscle spindles and the GTOs, those are really activating a stretch reflex, perineal reaction time. They're really important to ankle joint position sense, which is extremely important for balance. Okay. So we're combining this, right? We're doing whatever balance exercises we want to do. You want to do this in another way that bumps it up even higher, integrate dual tasking. So if you are throwing cognitive tasks at your client to improve their, their balance and their ability to dual task cognitive and subconscious stabilization, you gotta turn up the volume to the noise, the sensory noise of the body, barefoot on Naboso, K-tape on the ankle. Boom, you've stacked them tactily and proprioceptively. Have them hold the neural ball at the same time as well. All right, sensory stacking number two, tactile plus visual. So here you are going to have, and of course you could have proprioceptive in here as well. So tactile, proprioceptive, and visual. Okay. So with the tactile, of course, we're staying with Naboso. With the visual, what we're doing is we are looking in a mirror. So I love this one. And I do this with all of my patients that have neuropathy, uh, whether it's motor or sensory neuropathy, I will have them uh, get a little step, whether it's an aerobic step or kind of like a little kitchen step, but it's a safe low to the ground step, but figure it's one step up. And they're putting the Naboso material or the Naboso mat on top of it. And then they're facing a mirror. So they could just be in a full length bathroom mirror or dressing room mirror, or if they're at a gym or a facility or you at your facility have mirrors for the patient to look at themselves, I love the mirrors. The purpose is if I'm looking at the mirror, I'm I, standing, I see the mat on the step, I see my feet, right? I'm staring at the step with the material and I'm staring at my feet. Every time I step onto the step, I'm going to feel the Naboso material, but I'm looking at my foot hitting the material and the step. Okay, so what we're doing is we're compounding the sensory experience that I see my foot feeling the texture or the stimulation. That is the stacking or this multi-sensory heightening that I'm referencing. So by me combining those two or three input systems, I get a greater effect, a greater activation into my nervous system. Okay, now, as I do this, right, and I step and I feel and I see, I am creating synapses that are translating to coordinated motor responses, okay? Now, of course, we don't want to be dependent on the mirror. That's not what I'm saying. But if I were to have someone do the step up on the step with the material on it, right, and they they don't know where their feet are because they have neuropathy, right? What are they going to do? Your patient is going to look like this, right? Is that how I want them to be looking at the street or the sidewalk as they walk? No, we are trying to build foot awareness, kinesthetic awareness of the foot so that they don't have to look down, which then throws off, oh my God, I just threw off my vestibular system because I look down, right? So that translation is really important. Could you take them from doing this simple step up, right? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, looking at themselves in the mirror and then just turn them and have them do the exact same thing, but they're not looking in the mirror. But the height, the pattern, the pace is all predictable to their nervous system. And then could you translate that through maybe stepping off of the step? 
versus stepping up on the step. Okay, really, really, really powerful of how we want that to be translated for them. Okay, so that would be that stacking. Now, when you look at sensory stacking, the one sensory input system that seems to have the greatest compounding effect for these patients and the other input systems is visual. So if you can look at your hand when it's touching the neural ball, if you can look at your foot when it's stepping on the step, if you can look at your foot as it's being vibrated through the power plate or whatever it is, right? You get a increased V1 S1 response within the neocortex. Okay, so let's go into our third sensory stacking. And again, this one, I do apologize, I would put proprioceptive, so tactile, proprioceptive, visual, and auditory. Let's loop them all in there. This one's not going to have vestibular, it's going to have auditory as the sensory trigger, okay? So here, what we're doing, very similar. We're doing the same step up, same step up that we did before, but this time, every time the patient's foot hits the step with the naboso on it and they're looking at it in the mirror either you are going to something you're going to clap you're going to ring a bell you're going to hit something right i need there to be this auditory association to tactile visual step proprioceptive okay and that is then increasing s1 v1 even higher and then the ultimate is going to be over here, M1. Your motor output is just going to be heightened because of all of this stacking that we did on the other side, okay? So that is a really good example of how you could bring in that auditory, that tactile, that proprioceptive, and of course, the uh, visual side of that as well, okay? So that we have is our Second takeaway, second layer to a sensory-based programming for fall reduction. Real quick as a brief summary. So step one, we did sensory conflict. What are you doing right now to create sensory conflict in your patient's or client's programming? What are you doing to then over here do sensory stacking? Are you looking at multi-sensory input to create a heightened motor response and motor sequencing or synapses within the nervous system? Okay. And then the third and final takeaway for our programming is going to be what's called remapping. Now, this is really specific to tactile input, which I love just as Nabo. So I love tactile input, but Sensory remapping or tactile remapping is taking a stimulus and then putting a orientation to it with our body, with ourselves, with the external world, and then creating the motor response. Okay. Now, one of the examples that you will see when you read about tactile remapping research is the example of holding a coffee cup. Now, if I am holding a coffee cup in one way or holding the coffee cup and not holding the coffee cup. But if I'm holding a coffee cup or a plate of food or something, and I feel like a tickle on the back of my hand, which is a fly, right? So I'm holding something. I have to then create a different motor response to kind of brush the fly away versus if it's by my side and I felt the fly and I, it, I did some motor response, right? So the fact that one hand is orientated this way, holding something in front of my body, I have all this input system from the cup versus not holding something relaxed by my side, not hold, right? That I can have a different response. The trigger or the sensory input was exactly the same. It was the fly stimulating the nerves on the cutaneous surface. The motor response had to be remapped because of my, it's called body schema, the perception of my limb and um, body orientation in relation to itself and the external world. Okay. So I had to be able to very rapidly say, no, holding something hand is this way. You can't, right, brush the fly away that way. Really, really good analogy, I find, to help you to understand 
from a central nervous system perspective very quickly, that tactile remapping side of things. And that's necessary for creating the motor patterns to control our body so that we don't fall, okay? So tactile remapping is closely linked to the coordination of motor responses, motor movement, that's the name of the game here. So the first one that we can do is based off of our ability to perceive which limit is right versus left. So we're orientating left versus right. So different sides of the body. So for this one, what you would do is you wouldn't necessarily have to do it that way, but the arms would be in front. So the patient is essentially putting the arms. I'm just kind of crossing my arms down this way. Okay. Eyes could be open for the first one. Eyes closed is obviously going to be more challenging. Okay. Now go back to what you just learned. So if I'm in my shoes and I have this sensory conflict anyway in the first place, and then you do this to me, technically it would be more challenging. So shape it with a logic behind why you're doing something, okay? But hands are in front, the eyes are shut, let's say in this example. You are going to touch different parts. So I'm gonna to touch the top of the hand, this way eyes are shut. And you want the patient to say, is that right or left? right? Right hand or left hand. And then you'll touch the bottom of it, right? And then you'll touch maybe the outside of the pinky. And you're essentially going back and forth and you are having them uh, from a cognitive perspective or a orientation perspective, be able to differentiate right versus left side of the body. And the quicker they can do that, obviously, the better that is, okay? So when you look at tactile remapping in a lot of the research, what they will use is a hand cross pattern is crossing the midline is feeding different parts of the brain and is uh, crossing through the corpus callosum. So this is a very good way to challenge that component. Okay. Technically you could do the same thing if they were seated in a chair and their ankles were crossed, you could do that same thing, stimulate their left foot and then have them. Is that the right side or the left side? Right. Okay. So something that you can do. And I really like that one. Uh, now, tactile remapping, the second one is going to be about varying foot stimulation. Now, a lot of times, and it, this is just to be a trigger, this is not exactly how you're doing it, but oftentimes when we think of stimulating the feet for balance, posture, and gait, we're thinking of it in relation to this, right? Like I'm looking at my feet, my body is vertical, gravity is above me, and I'm essentially in that alignment, okay? That is a very predictable pattern from a tactile remapping perspective for the patient. If you put their feet and stimulate them in non- foot ground or vertical orientation, you trigger and challenge the nervous system even more. So that means that if you were here, technically she's here and she's not in a vertical position, you could stimulate the bottom of the foot, maybe with, you know, two point discrimination, maybe with sharp doll, maybe with the tuning fork, whatever it is that you could stimulate the bottom of the foot. If they were in, um, a quadruped and how you can extend one leg and one arm and it's a, a balanced position, you could technically stimulate the bottom of the foot where it's vertical. Um, so just think of that that way. If their feet are against the wall, you could have the feet against the wall and they're in a knees bent 90 degree, but the feet, instead of being on the floor, they're against the wall. Great way to bring tactile input to the feet in an orientation that is not predictable to the nervous system. Okay. And then your third and final way that you can bring in tactile remapping to, again, the purpose of tactile remapping is to coordinate the subsequent motor response. So here that could be catching a ball in varying positions. I would use an arrow ball just because it's more sensory stimulating, but if I'm going to catch the ball this way and throw it in this orientation, that is very different than if I caught it underhand and I'm going to throw it this way versus if I get it from the side and I'm going to throw it this way. Okay. So it is forcing the nervous system to see, okay, caught this way, throw this way. Right. Very important again, to the way that we coordinate the nervous system and ultimately our movement. Okay. 
Perfect. Great. So let's do a quick little recap, and then we are going to jump into any questions that you have. I will briefly introduce Naboso, and then I will allow Libby to speak briefly about body track. But the goal of this webinar was to bring a little bit logical or reasoned variability to the programming that you're doing right now is thinking about those four input systems and seeing how you could either challenge them, force an upregulation of the other input systems, create a stacking or a compounding effect through these input systems through intelligent integration, tactile, proprioceptive, hands, feet, visual, vestibular, auditory, and then finally, how to incorporate remapping. So the more that we create varying scenarios to challenge and create a response. So you throw the patient from a sensory perspective into a situation and then essentially say, now what? What are you going to do? So that's what we want to do. We don't always want to do eyes open, head neutral, feet barefoot, on Naboso. I would love that because it's on Naboso, but we don't want to always be in that safe perspective. I love it. That's where I like to start patients because we need to set a base. But once they've proven themselves in that base, let's start to create, maybe I would probably say do the sensory stacking first. From there, if you've got someone who's got really good stacking and multi-sensory integration, then let's bump it up a notch, not by necessarily throwing them on super unstable surfaces, but let's just create a variety of sensory conflict and see what the nervous system does. I would then do the sensory conflict while throwing dual tasking at them, and that further challenges or further creates more conflict for them. Okay, and then of course the remapping is of course really important because of how it relates to what's called body schema. And I wrote a recent uh, blog on the Barefoot Strong blog, which is barefootstrongblog.com about body schema and, and tactile remapping, just in case if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Now, for those that may not be familiar with Naboso, uh, we are a sensory product line. We are a two-point discrimination product line. So all of our materials have these little pyramids across them. The neural ball has the pyramids across it. And we are stimulating the mechanoceptor, the nerve in the palm of the hands and the bottom of the feet that is sensitive to two-point discrimination. Two-point discrimination is essentially Braille. So when your hand reads Braille, you are stimulating that nerve. Okay, we have insoles, we have mats, we have flooring, we have release tools, and we have two very cool products that are coming out uh, this summer. So definitely stay tuned for that. And then we happen to also be the top cover of Body Track. So I'm going to allow Libby to speak about Body Track so you guys can understand this awesome assessment tool and how you can actually incorporate the reason that it has Noboso on top. Can, everyone, can you hear me, Emily? Can you hear me? So one second, I will make sure that Libby is unmuted. Yes. Can you hear me now? Mute. Can you hear me now? Okay, Libby, you're unmuted. Hmm. I don't know why. And unfortunately, we cannot hear her. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I'm not sure why it's not working. I don't know. So, yeah. You can hear. Her. Okay. So, if people can hear her, I can't hear her. But, oh, oh okay. Everybody can hear me. I'll just say something quickly. So I'm sorry you can't hear me, Emily. Uh, oh, no, no, I can't. My computer oh, yeah. was on mute. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, folks. Yeah, 
So thanks for letting me know you can hear me, uh, Stacy and Georgette. I really appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to Emily for being our first host with, the, with our educational program here. Um, and I want to thank her for her brilliance. I do want to tell you guys, anytime I hear Emily uh, speak, I learn something new or, I, or something very thought provoking. It's always such a pleasure. So we are Body Track Biometrics. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but uh, Emily has included a nice slide for us. Uh, body Track Biometrics and Naboso uh, both have a, a similar missions in that we provide tools to help people move better. That's really our entire focus is to move better, uh, live life better, perform better. So that is one of the reasons why we have uh, been a partner with Naboso for several years. And as Emily mentioned, we do have her co their covers. Naboso covers are on top of our uh, pressure mapping tools that we have. Really, the use, the whole purpose is to allow you as a clinician, as a wellness specialist, as a sports specialist, to assess retrain movement mechanics, and then evaluate the outcome of that. Uh, we are pressure mapping uh, system with the uh, Nervoso covers on them. We have applications in healthcare, wellness, sports performance, and the whole basis really is to be able to determine the relationship that your patients, clients, and athletes have with the ground. So it's, it really is an amazing system that gives you some uh, great information about how people are using the ground to push power through their body for stability and for uh, balance. And then also gives you the opportunity to use a really nice visual real-time biofeedback uh, module to retrain movements and have them participate and get them engaged in what I always refer to as experience the aha moment, the Oprah aha moment of, ah, I didn't realize I was doing that. Didn't know I was all the way over on my right side instead of symmetrical. So um, we love working with Dr. Emily and Naboso because we have similar uh, goals in trying to help people just move better and be more balanced and stable. So thanks, Emily. Of course, thank you so much. And uh, if you have not tried Body Track or are not familiar with their system, definitely reach out to Libby. But again, think of it as, as not just an assessment tool. One, it's a biofeedback tool, which I love that feature of it because it has real time uh, pressure distribution and COG shifts that the patient can feel and see and then find what center feels like. But then it's also a training mat. So you, you kind of get a free Naboso mat in one, <laughs> which is great. And then it helps the patient feel what the difference of having that tactile input of the feed is. Um, if we want to integrate what the Navoso products and then assessing their, their balance on body track does from a multi-sensory integration is if they have uh, multi-sensory conflict. So they have uh, hearing loss, they have cataracts, they have decreased vision, they have neuropathy. You've got to, you've got to give them something to win. That, that is a real life transfer scenario for a patient to be in conflict, in sensory conflict, but you don't then want to say like, okay, nervous system, figure it out. Like you got to give them something. And that's what I find Naboso is and tactile through the feet is that it gives them a solution to that conflict because they have so many systems that are part of that conflict. If it was just neuropathy, but they had strong vestibular and strong visual, okay. But there is a very high fall risk when you start to lose that tactile connection. So um, great system, super synergistic to Navoso, which is again, why we're working together. I do wanna see if anyone has any questions about the content that we went over, um, just as you are here tuned in live, I am happy to go over any questions that you may have uh, regarding that. And if you don't, 
not a problem. What we will do is we will be sending everyone the recording as well as the PowerPoint and you will have Libby's contact information as well as my contact information. So you can explore both of these um, product lines more and see how they could integrate into your, you know, balanced programming or a fall reduction program that you may oversee. Um, and if anyone has any questions for Libby, you can of course type those in as well. So Emily, can you remind them we have another uh, another webinar next week as well? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Libby. So next week, same time, same place. Hopefully, I see you there. We are doing one on uh, feet function and fascia lines. So we're going to be applying this to. Still, it applies to everyone, but this is going to hit a little bit more of the performance side. Um, that deep dive of the fascial lines, of course, everything connects sensory and everything's going to connect to um, our ability to balance on one leg, super effective. Um, but that webinar, same, we'll send you a sign up to everyone who signed up for this. Um, it is on the Body Track site and it's on the Noboso Instagram. Um, it's linked in our bio there. But again, feet, function, fascial lines next week, same time, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Eastern. And then we have a golf one that is Ju July 19th. Yeah, July 19th at the same time, I believe, 6 p.m. And we will make sure that in this kind of recap of this email that you get that sign up as well. So Emily, Linda sent you a question. I uh, don't know if you saw it. Regarding the Naboso incels, what do you recommend best for plantar fasciitis issues? Uh, yes, so uh, all of our insoles, just briefly, are flat. So this is two millimeters and they're freely flexible. So sometimes people think, how is that going to help plantar fasciitis? Um, it does. And the reason is that when you bring sensory stimulation to the feet, in this case, we're talking about Naboso sensory stimulation, you then activate the nerves to get the intrinsic muscles engaging. So it is a great way to build the natural strength of the foot back. And then if you need to wear a orthotic or an arch support, our insoles, because they're so thin and freely movable, they go on top of the arch support and you can actually combine. So you get a biomechanical arch support and the sensory top cover of Naboso. And that's that's our lane that we want to stay in is we are the sensory layer to optimize the foot. Um, so that's what I would suggest. And I would say to get the activation, which is the blue one. Thanks. And then Stacy sent a message. It is, can you see it? Uh, for a client progressing to irreversible blindness, what other sense would you highlight primarily with the stacking? Good question. Yeah, that is a really good question. So with the blindness, you're taking away visual, right? So they are going to actually be heightened. It's just going to be an auto um, response, almost like collateral circulation. If you've ever heard of when people start to get intermittent claudication or they lose circulation to part of the muscle or the tissue, they start to get new blood vessels that grow and create collateral circulation. Same thing happens with the other input systems. So the representation of those other input systems in the brain map is actually going to heighten. The hand is going to be much more acute or greater represented in the somatosensory cortex, the feet will, and then the same thing with the vestibular. So uh, that patient or client is going to rely more on those other ones. Um, so I would go towards um, tactile hand, tactile feet, of course, we spoke about that, but I would use wrist weights I would use compression apparel. I would use uh, kinesiology tape. So those are my three favorite um, other input systems is weight. So uh, weighted vest, wrist weight, wrist weights, ankle weights, um, compression, either compression sleeves, compression apparel, or then the proprioceptive tape of kinesiology. That, that's what I would do for that individual. Nice. And then one more question. Do you see from Andrea? Andrea? Yes. Uh, any populations diagnosis that are contraindicated, or you wouldn't suggest using these techniques. Um, so all of these techniques are 
uh, but part of the reality of how your nervous system processes information and creates optimal motor responses. So everyone uses them. Now, the way that you integrate them and the complexity or the progression or regression of them is really, that's up to you, making sure that it's safe, it's individualized, it meets their goals, then it is safe. So do we need to just not step up yet, but just balance in a narrow stance, barefoot on the Naboso mat or on the body track system, and then just look at our body in the mirror. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. And we start there, right? So all of them can be incorporated. That's why I also said, start with the stacking versus the sensory conflict. And I feel that a lot of a lot of the trainers that I encounter, again, not everyone, but a lot, is that they will think that for me to challenge someone's balance, I have to be on something unstable. So I have to get on a BOSU or a Dyna disc or something like that, a wobble board. You are creating sensory conflict. That is very challenging to someone who maybe has already a conflicted sensory processing system. Um, so do be very careful with that one. Stack first, remap, and then add conflict. That's the order at which I would do that. Really good question. Really good question. Um, you're so welcome, Andrea. Uh, Luis asks, is it helpful to walk on gravel? <clears throat> so it is beneficial to walk on different surfaces. So let's say pebbles, turf, Naboso, hardwood, wrestling mat, different inclines, right? So you're creating surface variability. Surface variability means what is the durometer? So think about that, right? What is the surface shape? So like the irregularity of it, right? So it's kind of like, uh, think of if you were hiking and you're on a stick or on a rock. So there's just irregular stimuli to the ankle and the nervous system. Um, the gravel may be too painful. Um, I know my baby could probably sprint across it <laughs> and my husband would be tiptoeing across it. Um, so it, it just depends on the individual. I would probably start with maybe smooth pebbles that they're walking across and there's pebble paths that you can buy um, as well. But your head's in the right place. I love it. You're just going to the, you're going to the challenging right away. <laughs> which is great. Good. Great. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much for your time. I know Libby is also really appreciative of your time. Uh, you will get this recording. Please do sign up for next week's as well. Uh, we are really here to help people understand what we're trying to do at Body Track and Naboso. And this webinar series, including the one that's in July on golf, are all really intended to just educate, educate, educate. The more we educate, the better that you become and we help more people. So thank you so much from myself and Naboso. And then thank you. From, thank you to Dr. Emily, first of all, and for all of you spending your time with us this evening. Thanks from Body Track. Great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.